The discovery of transitional fossils is one of the most compelling lines of evidence for evolution because the theory of evolution actually allows us to predict the anatomy that these ancient skeletons will have even before their fossils are unearthed. The most common examples of transitional fossils often brought up in discussions include Archaeopteryx, of course, which was one of the first of these strange, hybrid-looking creatures predicted to exist by Charles Darwin himself, and was found just two years after the theory of evolution was introduced, bearing the teeth and skeletal structure similar to that of a velociraptor, but with the feathers and wings of a bird, a pure example of a transitional fossil. Another commonly cited example is Australopithecus, the long-searched-for missing link between humans and more basal ape species, or Tiktaalik, the transitional fossil between ocean-dwelling fish and land vertebrates. Scientists actually predicted not only its anatomy beforehand, but even the location where they would find it. Whale and horse evolution are also very commonly brought up when discussing transitional fossils. But today, I want to shine a light on some lesser-known examples, the ones that aren't brought up as much. I cannot even hope to cover all the hundreds of known transitional fossils in this video, but I wanted to highlight some of the cool and interesting ones. When two species are genetically similar, like adjacent groups on a phylogenetic tree, we tend to find fossils that have intermediate features converging on a common ancestor of both groups. This type of pattern should only happen if evolution is true, and indeed the theory of evolution allows us to predict these transitional fossils. For example, dogs and bears are neighbors on the phylogenetic tree, so if the remains were preserved then we should find fossils of dog-like bears and bear-like dogs converging towards a common caniform ancestor. And indeed, fossils of bears with more dog-like characteristics were discovered in the 1920s, called hemicyanins. And even before that, the basal caniforms, known as amphicyanids, were first discovered by Haeckel himself soon after Darwin published The Origin of Species. They are colloquially known as bear dogs. For another example, it was long predicted that ants evolved from non-social wasps in the Cretaceous period, but for most of the 20th century, the fossil record for ants only extended to the early Cenozoic, and we didn't have any fossils from the Cretaceous itself. In 1967, however, this changed, as an ant species was found preserved in amber from the Cretaceous period. It had wasp-like structure with ant-like characteristics. In fact, there was debate about whether it was a wasp or an ant until it was finally discovered to have a metapleural gland, which solidified its placement as a true ant, albeit the most anatomically primitive ant species known at the time, another transitional fossil. Earlier, I mentioned whale evolution as a well-known example with many known transitionals, from Indohyus to Ambulocetus and Basilosaurus, but what about transitional species for other mammals that also returned to the sea from land, like seals? Well, in 2007, Pujila Darwini was found providing just such a missing link for seal evolution. It had the skull and teeth of a seal, but a body more closely resembling an otter, with minimal adaptations for swimming. And what about the third major kind of aquatic mammals, the Cyrenians, like manatees and dugongs? Pizosiren was first discovered in 2001, showing skull, teeth, and ribs characteristic of manatees, but with four limbs for walking on land, a perfect example of a transitional fossil. What about non-mammals who return to the sea after living life on land? There are, of course, the marine reptiles, like mosasaurs, who dominated the oceans of the Mesozoic. It was a fossil discovered in my hometown of Dallas, which shed light on this very transition. Dallasaurus has the anatomical features of a mosasaur, except with limbs that were still capable of walking on land, 
It's almost like every time there is an aquatic animal that evolution predicts evolved from a land animal, we then go on to find fossils showing that exact transition. For another example, just to really drive the point home, look at Nothosaurus, a transitional species of reptiles that still maintained functional limbs, elbows, and knee joints, but with the long neck and body plan characteristic of the later plesiosaurs. And let's stick to this theme of elongation and talk about snake evolution. Based on comparative anatomy, there is a consensus that snakes evolved from lizards. So there must have been a transitional period where creatures existed with intermediate anatomy between snakes and lizards. And when we examine the fossil record, we find that the oldest example of fossil snakes have limbs in varying degrees of functionality. Some, like Najash, had two hind limbs for burrowing, while others, like Eupodophis, had tiny little legs and pelvic bones that weren't even connected to their vertebrae. You just have to love these wacky guys. Speaking of wacky, one of my favorite transitions is that of flatfish evolution. For many years, creationists claimed that it would be impossible for evolution to explain flatfishes like the flounder, because any creatures with intermediate anatomy between regular fish and flatfish, which have both eyes asymmetrically on one side of their head, wouldn't be able to survive very well. They had to drop this argument, however, when amphistium was discovered in 2008, with eye placement in the exact intermediate position predicted by evolution. Now, Everyone talks about dinosaur transitions to birds, like Anchiornis, but I wanted to highlight some other dinosaur transitions that are just as replete with transitional fossils, like the evolution of Triceratops from creatures that look almost like bipedal lizards. Yinlong, discovered in 2005, are the most basal known Ceratopsians, smaller than most dogs. However, its rostral bone, that toothless tip on its beak, is a feature unique to Ceratopsians and marks Yinlong as a true transitional species. Next is the more derived Cetacosaurus, which is intermediate between later Ceratopsians and Yinlong. The next step leads us to the Leptoceratopsids, and then the Protoceratopsids, like Bagaceratops, then finally, we have the true Ceratopsians, like Zuniceratops, which is the earliest one found with the characteristic horns like a Triceratops, whose anatomy is much more basal than the other Ceratopsians, but is more derived than the Protoceratopsids, another intermediary transition fossil. And then, of course, there are dozens of transitional species just within the Ceratopsians themselves. Stellosaurus, for example, is an intermediate transition between Styracosaurus and Aeneasaurus. Moving to another major group of dinosaurs, Eoraptor is one of the most basal sauropodomorphs known. Superficially, it looks more like a raptor than a long-necked sauropod. We see the transition between these two in prosauropods, like Platyosaurus, which is intermediate in both size and shape, having a long neck and tail, but still retaining its bipedalism. The next step grew even larger in size, with longer necks and quadrupedalism. However, the Lessomsaurids show signs that they could still use their forelimbs for grasping, another intermediate trait. However, most are known by only partial skeletons, Pulanosaura, for example, and Antetonitris, with a shape like a sauropod but with more intermediate foot anatomy. Cotosaurus is one of the most basal true sauropods, already a behemoth, but with many skeletal features betraying transitional anatomy in its limbs. The evolution of mammals is another area most people consider mammals and reptiles as so different that a creature with mosaic qualities of the two is difficult to imagine. So the fact that we find fossils of such creatures really should garner more attention. The transition from more lizard-like animals to mammals involves many bizarre hybrid-looking animals that are utterly unlike anything alive today. But 
which were predicted using the theory of evolution before their fossils were ever found. In the late 1800s, paleontologist Harry Seeley made several predictions about the anatomy of a predicted transitional creature between reptiles and mammals, including the shape of its jaw and palate, and in 1895 his predictions were proven correct by Cynognathus, which has many mammalian features like fur and canine teeth, its hind limbs were positioned underneath its pelvis like a mammal, but its forelimbs sprawled out like a reptile. It is a type of animal known as a therapsid, which are intermediate between mammals and more basal synapsids. Synapsids are a very big clade, the only members of which surviving today are the mammals. But the most basal synapsids more closely resemble something like a lizard, such as Archaeothyrus or Eothyrus, some of the earliest and most basal synapsids known. We can trace the evolutionary development of synapsids next to Haptidus, a basal sphenacodont. Intermediate between the sphenacodonts and the later therapsids like Cynognathus are the more basal therapsids like Raronimus which is giving an uncanny valley feeling as we transition from more reptile-like to more mammalian features. Theriodonts develop next, and cynodonts come toward the end of the Permian era and are the most mammal-like yet. Theraxodon follows in the next age, the dawn of the Mesozoic, where therapsids lose their dominant status and reptiles take over the earth. Cynodonts developed into mammalia forms, which coexisted with dinosaurs and which I have covered in a previous video. Morganocodon from this period is extremely similar to true mammals in appearance, but still has some more primitive skeletal features that true mammals no longer have. Another transitional is Hadracodium, considered just on the cusp of true mammals and the most closely related of the mammalia forms. Finally, Jeremiah is one of the most basal true placental mammals discovered in 2011 from the late Jurassic period, but evolution is not unique to just animals. Soon after Darwin's time, the search began for transitional fossils of plant species as well, and in the early 20th century, a fossil plant was found with intermediate properties midway between non-vascular bryophytes, a group that includes plants like mosses, and the early vascular plants, like ferns. This transitional was called rhinia. Another, even earlier basal example of this transition is cooksonia, the earliest known plant to have a vascular stem. The evolutionary transition to seeds, too, has transitions. In 2004, a fossil plant species known as runcaria was discovered. It predates all known fossil seeds by millions of years, and although it lacks true seeds, it contains an enclosed capsule of spores and has all the properties of seed plants except for a seed coat and a mechanism to guide pollen to the ovulum. It does have adaptations for wind-based dispersal and is an important transitional showing how plants evolved seeds. And finally, for human evolution, everyone always brings up Lucy, an australopith but I hardly ever see the more basal Artipithecus or Sahelanthropus being discussed, or the fact that the most basal member of genus Homo, Homo habilis, has features that are so similar to Australopiths that some paleoanthropologists are even suggesting that they be reassigned to genus Australopithecus instead of genus Homo. Homo habilis provides a missing link between Homo sapiens and the other missing link, Australopithecus. And Homo erectus provides the missing link between Homo habilis and Homo sapiens, and so on and so on, transitions all the way up and down the evolutionary tree from humans all the way back to single cells. I could go on and on highlighting transitional fossils all day. I didn't even touch on horse, elephant, camel, feline, theropod, amphibian, or mollusk evolution in this video. It is amazing that anyone can deny evolution in this day and age with so many transitional fossils predicted and successfully discovered. The pattern we have seen matches evolutionary predictions for intermediate transitional anatomies 
We never find mosaic fossils with intermediate features of two groups that are phylogenetically distant and that evolution would not predict to have a recent common ancestor. The fact that we only find transitional forms between species that evolution predicts we should find is some of the most compelling evidence to see evolution happen before our very eyes. Hopefully, you learned more about some of these transitions in this video. Thank you, and stay learning for the next base theory.